This morning we're looking at um, Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 26 through 35, again to just get another part of the picture of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, of his being sent into the world. But I should mention that the, the text we're going to be looking at primarily is, is not this text, but the one that I quoted a little bit earlier, and that is John 3.16, because that really summarizes for us what it is we want to look at this morning, and that is God's great love, God so loved that he gave. Uh, Luke chapter 1, I'd like to read verses 26 through 35. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. May the Lord bless again his word to our hearing this morning. May he use it to encourage us, to build us up, or even to save us if we do not know him. Now, um, as we've already noted this morning, is uh, this is um, traditionally Christmas Day. I think we all understand that, and I think we also understand that we like Christmas. I think we can agree with most of the people out there that it is uh, the most wonderful time of the year, and I think it is. It is a very uh, uh, good season because of the things that happen. I mean, what are the things that make Christmas special? Well, for one thing, we get to spend time with family and friends, and I think that that's probably the most important thing. Uh, we get to share in some good food. There's always a lot of good food around, especially a lot of sweets. We've got to watch out how much we eat, especially if we happen to be watching our weight. But we also get to give gifts to the people that we love. And I think we understand what uh, the Lord Jesus said to the Apostle Paul on one occasion. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is a blessing to give as children. We love to receive things. We liked it when, you know, there were a lot of gifts for us under the tree. But as adults, we understand it really is more blessed to give, isn't it? There's just something about giving that is really special. And I think we also like this time of the year because everybody around us typically seems to be a bit friendlier than they might otherwise be. At least they are unless you happen to be fighting, you know, with them for a parking spot at the mall or maybe you're, you're uh, also struggling over the a particular item you want to buy, the last of its kind. But overall, people are generally friendlier. Christmas is also a time when we tend to, to feel, I think, a greater goodwill towards others when we think about the needs of other people, the needs of our neighbors, of their hardships, their sufferings, the losses that they're going to feel more keenly, at this particular time of the year, as we drive in now each week, we see that huge scar on the tree that's next to, you know, in the building next to us. Every time I see that, I realize there was a young lady a couple weeks ago who died there. And I can imagine what the family must be going through at this particular time of the year, as well as those of us who are going to miss our loved ones. So we think about the needs of our neighbors. We think about more about those around us. And we, we think about what can we do perhaps to give to them, to minister to them, to comfort them. Uh, in a very real sense, this time of the year is a time when we tend to live more like Christians. When we tend to become more like what the Lord actually calls us to be, which is givers and not merely receivers. And we should ask the question, why is it that we feel that way? 
at this time of the year, perhaps more than others. And I think it's likely because during, it's during this season that we're reminded of the greatest gift that was ever given. When God gave the world his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that babe who was born of a virgin so many years ago and laid in a manger. And why it is that God gave him. It was because of his great love for fallen mankind that he might relieve the suffering of all who would believe him and receive the gift of his son. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is just take a few moments and, and consider the love that the Lord has shown us. That, and basically um, how the gift that he gave this world shows us how great his love actually is. And remember, this is the love that he has for you if you have trusted in the Lord. And if you haven't trusted in the Lord, it's the love that he offers to you if you will only receive it. Now, I want us to look at four things, at least four perspectives or four reasons why or four ways we can see how great this love is. Uh, the first one comes from who it is that showed us this love. The second one would be the character of the recipients of this gift that was given of God's love. Uh, thirdly, who it is that the Lord actually gave to us. And then fourthly, what he is willing to give us if we will receive this free gift. And all of these, again, show us how great God's love is. Well, first of all, let's consider who this one is that showed us this great love. Now, I do want to uh, divert just a bit at this point, uh, take a few moments to make sure we know who it is we're talking about when we're talking about God, because uh, we want to give credit to whom credit is due, and we really can't assume that the word God means the same thing uh, to everyone. And I think at the same time as we consider what is true of the God who gave, we're going to see that he is different than the gods of the world, that he is distinguished from them by several in several different ways. So if we ask, how can we identify this particular God who gave so many years ago, how would we do that? Well, first of all, I think we can distinguish him by the fact that he is the only God among all the gods of all the religions of the world that really exists. Now, that may sound a bit biased, but it is actually true. There is only one God, and it is the God of the Bible, the God who gave. Now, if we're believers, we already know that to be true. We know this by experience. Those of us who have actually believed in His Son and taken hold of Him, we, we know without, without doubt, really, that these things are true. What the Bible says is true, and, and what it says about the God who created the world, what the Bible says about it is true. We, we know that what we see in nature is the same thing that we actually see here. Now I should also mention this, that we, we also know that there can only be one God by reason. And really we could get into this for a little bit, but I, I, I just want to give one quick argument so don't get too sidetracked by this. There can only be, as we, as we consider the world around us, as we consider the universe, as we consider just the dimensions of this creation, I mean how big is it? How far does space go if you go one direction and you just keep on going, how far does it go? Well, it goes on and on forever. Well, whatever caused this to be must be big enough to create it, right, or to cause it. So God is infinite. God is unlimited. And if you understand what that word means, you must know that that means there can only be one. There can only be one because you can't have two unlimiteds. That would cancel them out. You can't have two infinites. There must be one infinite. God is infinite. Only God is infinite. There can only be one God. And the God of the Bible is the only God who is actually like that. So he can be distinguished by the fact that he is infinite. And he is the only God. Now we know that again by experience. We know that by what God shows us in the creation. But we also know it because that's what he's told us in his word. And of course, this is the most trustworthy uh, testimony that he's given to us. God says in his word in Isaiah 45 verses 5 and 6, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I will gird you though you have not known me. 
that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that is all around the world that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. So this God who gave is the only God who exists and he is the infinite God. And of course, because he is the only God, he can also be distinguished by the fact that he is the creator. He is the one who made us. He is the one who made us in his image. And he is the one who made everything that we see. Now here's another point where we don't want to get bogged down, but I just wanted to give some evidence for those of you here this morning who might think that somehow everything we see came about by accident. I want to point out that the evidence of a creator is actually all around us, and I think the most powerful evidence is sitting before us right now as we look at one another. Every living thing that we see on earth, including us, plants, fish, birds, mammals, man, all living creatures show amazing design. And let me just point out, I think, one of the most compelling arguments that, that, that I've heard um, and maybe you haven't been exposed to it, maybe you have, but again, the DNA molecule. I think you understand that every living cell has a nucleus, and in the nucleus there is the DNA molecule, which is a very long molecule. I think it's a human DNA, if stretched out, and again, there's one of these in every single one of the trillions of cells in our body. If it's stretched out, I believe it's supposed to be like six feet long. And encoded on this molecule is, is a vast amount of information, as I understand, enough to fill uh, a thousand volumes, 500 pages each of complex chemical reactions, a blueprint to build the living being of which that cell is a part of. There's the information to build our entire body, exactly what we're like to our eye color, hair color, and even other information besides that is all encoded on that DNA. Now, not only is the information to build us encoded on the DNA molecule, but the information to put that information to use, how to use that information, is also encoded on the DNA molecule. So I understand about half of it is the information that it takes to build us, describes us. The other information is how to build us. And then you add to that the fact that all of this is encapsulated in a cell that is able to understand and comprehend what that information actually says. And it has the mechanics or the machinery inside of it to read that information and actually to do what it says. That's all there in a cell, in the trillions of cells that are in your body, as well as in every single living creature. Where did the information come from? to build us and to, I mean, not only again to describe us, but also to build us. Where did the mechanism come from? What makes those molecules that are actually doing all this work alive so that an RNA molecule can come in and can unzip the DNA, read it, close it back up, go out, and then put together the molecules it needs to and then put them in the right place? How does all that work by, by just some sort of cosmic accident that it all happened by chance? If you believe that, you either have more faith than I do or you're unwilling to believe the evidence. And I would say it's the latter. The evidence is, is overwhelming. We are designed. We are not an accident. And let's not forget that this design that we see extends beyond just living beings. It extends on a cosmic level to the, to the universe around us. The solar system that we're in, you know it has a a remarkable balance. Life is only possible on this particular earth. I mean, just consider what the other planets are like. And then the universe itself with all these galaxies, the more it's studied, the more it's seen, that even it shows the evidences of design. Now again, I would submit to you, these things did not happen by accident, but they were made by an infinite being. Again, there can only be one infinite, that one is God, the one we're talking about who gave. God is the one who made them. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then John writes, referring to our Lord Jesus Christ who is the one God gave, who is the eternal Son of God, in John 1 verse 3, all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being 
that has come into being. So what distinguishes the God that we're talking about who gave? Well, he's the only one who exists. He is infinite and he is the cause of everyone and everything that we see. Now, thirdly, he can be distinguished by the fact that he is triune. He is one God, one spiritual being that is infinite, but he is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, lastly, he can be distinguished by the fact that whatever uh, qualities he possesses, that he has in an unlimited amount. As we again consider the universe, consider the, the information, the design that's in each one of us. He has unlimited power. He has unlimited presence. He has unlimited knowledge. And he has unlimited wisdom, which is the ability to take that knowledge and to put it into some useful work. And we can see that again from what he has made. But now this is the point. He also has unlimited love. God is infinite in all of his attributes. Love is one of his attributes, and we need to be thankful for that because if God had not loved us, we would be lost. God not only perfectly loves everything that is right and good, but he has unlimited or infinite mercy and grace to show, which is why we will see that he was willing to give us what it is he has given us. So we see the greatness of God's love, first of all, in the fact that he is a God of infinite love. By the way, he's also a God of infinite justice, infinite wrath. Everything that God has, he has an infinite proportion, okay? But it's in his infinite love that he was willing to do what we're going to see that he did. So secondly, let's consider this, that the greatness of his love can be seen by whom he loved and what it is that John, or actually Jesus tells us he loved, was this world, this fallen and evil world. Not a world that was perfect, not a world that was pristine, not a world full of perfect people, but a world that was hostile towards him. Now we read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Life. What I want us to focus on here is the fact that God loved the world. What does Jesus mean when he's referring here to worlds? Well, again, he's not referring to this planet. He's not referring to the, you know, the, the, the living creatures that are inside this world necessarily, the universe that he has made. It is talking about mankind, but it's talking about fallen mankind because that is the condition of the world he sends his son into. Now, most people probably wouldn't even give this a second thought because they usually think they're pretty good. People think they're generally good. They haven't done anything terribly wrong. And again, if the balances of justice were weighed, uh, they put their good works on one side, they put their bad works on the other side, they would find their good works outweigh their bad works. So God should accept them. You know, we're, we're just, we're pretty good. We're just not that bad. But we do need to understand that isn't the case. The Bible says we're not that good. Now, God originally did make us good. That's the way that, that he made the first man and the first woman. Uh, we were perfect at the very beginning. We had perfect bodies that would never get sick, never grow old, would never die. We had perfect hearts. Just like God's heart in the sense that we loved what was good, we were like him in this way. We loved our neighbor. Uh, we never wanted anything, you know, any harm towards them. We would, we would keep God's commandments because those are the loving and right thing to do. That's what our heart was like at the very beginning. But the problem is we rebelled against him and became bad. We became very bad. We became his enemies. And I'll just... To demonstrate this, I'll just point you to the history of the world. It's filled with all kinds of bad things. Hatred, a man against his neighbor, bigotry, war. One person steals what another person has because he wants that thing. Uh, one country steals another country because they want what that country has. One person takes the life of another because maybe 
He doesn't like that person or that person did something bad to them. We are, we are the kind of people who profit from the suffering of others. You know, Karl Marx wrote a book, Communist Manifesto, and he talked about how the world would just be a wonderful place if everybody just shared and shared alike, if everybody shared the tools and the profits from all the work that was going on and so forth. And he said, in order to bring this about, we got to get rid of the government. And so they got rid of the government through revolution, and then they had to set up a temporary government to distribute all these, these goods, but then they found out this temporary government didn't want to give up its temporary power, and they began to oppress the people. And again, it just shows us the nature of mankind, that man really doesn't care about how their neighbor is doing as long as they have everything that they want. Man is evil. Now, apart from God's grace and His mercy, that's the way all of us are, you see. We were, apart from Jesus, as the Apostle Paul describes mankind in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So if we were to put out the scales of justice and let everybody weigh their good works versus their bad, which side is going to be heavier? And does it matter whether one side is heavier or the not? If, if there are bad works, how are they going to deal with those? We're going to see in a moment that our sins against God are so great that even one bad work would be enough to trump any supposed good works we did. But Paul says here that there is none who does good. We don't do anything good. When the Apostle Paul was saved, and he was saved from a life of, of religiosity, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says, all my, all my righteousness, all this that I was putting my trust in is like a, a, a mound of manure in the sight of God. It's dung. It's, it's worse than worthless. It's a stench in God's nostrils. He hates the smell of it. All our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. We have no good. Well, that is the character of the world. This is the world God is said to have loved. A world that was alienated from Him, a world that was hostile towards Him, a world that deserved His judgment, not mercy, not grace. There was nothing in this world that could have possibly drawn God's love out toward us, only His contempt which is why John uses, or I should say Jesus, uses the word that he does in John 3.16 for love. It is the highest form of love. It is superlative love. It is sacrificial love. It is a love that is under no obligation to show mercy to anyone, but one that describes purely the desire of the one who is loving. God so loved the world. What Jesus is telling us is that God chose to do, to show us love in spite of our evil condition, not because we were good. So here's the second way we see the greatness of God's love. First of all, we see that God is an infinite being who has infinite love, and that shows us how great it is. But he had to have that kind of love to be able to love a world like this, which is so evil in his sight a world that deserves only His judgment, God determined to show love. Now third, we see how great His love is in what His love moved Him to give, and that is His only Son. Now if God in His love was going to uh, do something to reach out to us to provide our needs in the condition that we we're in, if He was to pardon us for the crimes we have committed against Him, there had to be a price, a great price, that had to be paid. Now here again is where we see the, 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 the greatness of God's love. The debt that we owed to God's justice was unlimited, as unlimited as God is. Remember that God is infinite in every way. And God is not just love, but He is also justice. And God's justice had to be satisfied before He could show mercy, before He could show grace. The sins we committed against Him were infinite crimes because the crimes we committed were against 
an infinitely holy and worthy being and any one of the sins that we had committed, any one of them, only takes one, would have been enough to condemn us forever because they're committed against an infinitely holy and worthy being. But you see, we've committed more than one. One would be enough to condemn us, but we've committed far more than one. We could never have paid the debt, even for one, to, the, to his justice. We could never pay for it. But here is the love of God. What we could not do, God was willing to do. Now we just read in John 3.16 that this is how God loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son. He gave one who at the same time was the one who was most precious to Him. Remember when Jesus was baptized, the Father speaks out of heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He gave that one that was most precious to Him but he also gave the only one who could have paid our debt because the one he gave is God himself, the eternal Son of God. Remember what we read earlier. The angel said, well, basically when the angel told Mary that she was going to have a son, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her, you shall call his name Jesus. This came about to fulfill what the prophet said, you shall call his name or a virgin shall be with a child and shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's who this one was. And his name is Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. The Lord will save his people. This one who came into the world is the Lord. And if he is the Lord, then he is infinitely worthy, infinitely precious, which means he can pay this debt. God sent His Son into the world to become part of the creation. The Creator becomes one of His creatures. He became one with us to obey for us, to die for us, so that we might live. And again, this is the only way He could have done it, by giving the one He loved the most, which is His eternal Son, the one in His image, to become one with us, to suffer and die in our place. Now the fact that God sent His Son to, to go through this suffering on the cross proves that this is the only way that God could have saved us because if there was another way, He never would have put His Son through this agony. Remember Jesus Himself prayed in the garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but Your will be done. This was the only way our debt could be paid, one who had enough personal value to suffer in the place of a multitude which no one can number for everyone who would trust in him. It was the only way, but you see, God was willing to do this. He was willing to give his son. He was willing to do the only thing that could be done in order to save us because of his love toward us. He gave what was most precious to him so that we might be saved. And again, he gave while we were still his enemies. Christ died for us, is what the Bible says. So God shows his great love by giving what is most precious to those who hate him. That is the depth of his love towards this fallen world. Now, finally, we see how great his love is and what he is willing to give to us if we will only receive him. And what he gives to us is everything that Jesus actually earned through the work that he did. And it can all be summarized by these two words, eternal life. If we receive what God freely offers to us, what he freely gave while we were his enemies, if we will receive his son, he will forgive us not just of one of our crimes, but he will take away all of them. He will wash us and cleanse us from all of them, blot them out, of his record book so there will not be one thing left against us. If we receive his son, he will also give to us his son's perfect righteousness. That is his record of obedience so that we will have what we need to be acceptable to God. You know, the Bible says that God is so pure, so holy, that he cannot look upon sin with favor. He cannot have sinners in his presence. If we had any sin 
We would never be able to stand in his presence. We'd never be able to go to heaven. Jesus took care of all of that on the cross. Not only all the past sins, but the present sins and the future sins. If we only trust in him, he will blot them all out. But there's one other thing we need to stand in the presence of God. We actually have to be righteous. Righteousness is not the absence of sin. Righteousness includes that. But it also includes perfect obedience. We have to be those who love him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength and do all that is pleasing to him. Because if we don't, any area we fall short is sin and God cannot have sin in his presence. So we need to have no sin and we need to be perfectly righteous. Jesus gives that to us as well. That's why he came down as a child, grew up, obeyed, and served the Lord. He pleased him in every single way so that those who trust in him would have his righteousness and would be acceptable to him. If we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, this free gift that is given to us, God will adopt us as his own children. He will care for us. He will hear our prayers. <clears throat> he will protect us through this life, and he will bring us to heaven where he will love us and care for us for the rest of time. If we receive the Lord Jesus, he will give to us everything his son earns. You know, Jesus is the one who, whose work makes it possible for there to be a new heavens and a new earth where there's no sin, where there's no death, there's no sickness, there's no crying, there's no sorrow, only perfect joy and perfect blessedness. If we receive Jesus, he will give that to us as well, and we will live in that world of perfect love, joy, and peace for the rest of time. So in summary, God's love is so great that instead of giving us the hell we deserve, he's willing to give us the heaven we don't deserve at the cost of that which is most precious to him while we were still his enemies. This is the magnitude of God's love, and I hope we understand, I hope we see that, and I hope we're reminded of that uh, this morning, because that is what, again, Christmas reminds us of as, as believers, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift that God gave to us. We see its magnitude, and we understand our situation, we understand God, we understand who Jesus is, and what he is offering, what he has done, and what he offers to those who deserve quite the opposite. Now again, this is the gift that he offers, but if it's going to do us any good, we do have to receive it. It's not automatic, automatically applied to everybody in the world. It isn't. We have to receive him. Now, to do that, we have to believe everything we've just seen is true. We have to believe that. We have to believe God exists. We have to believe that he is loving. We have to believe he is just. We have to believe that we've committed these crimes against him. We need to be, of course, grieved that we've done that. We need to know we're helpless to save ourselves. We need to believe that he sent his son into the world to become one with us, to obey and to die for us, to be buried and raised again to life for us and to ascend into heaven and that he offers himself to us as a savior. We need to believe that. And believing these things, we also need to trust Jesus to save us. Now this distinguishes, I think, the faith of those who are believed, saving faith, from those who are uh, believers, true believers, from those who just simply believe. The, there's the facts. There's, there's a lot of churches that are filled with people who believe the facts, but haven't actually trusted Jesus. And what that means is they believe all these things are true, but they have never actually relied on Jesus, look to Jesus, are trusting him to get them into heaven and living every single day in reliance upon him as their only hope of heaven. You see, it's only once we actually rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work alone to save us that we're actually saved and that we're actually safe. But let me just take this one step further. Because sometimes we can believe that we actually have trusted in Jesus and we actually are safe when we aren't really safe. So how can we know that we really have trusted him and that we've gone beyond just simply believing the facts about him? Well, we can only know by the changes 
that he makes in our lives. The Bible says that if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, certain things will be true of us. We will stop doing the things that we were doing before that dishonor him. We call that sin. Those are the crimes we've committed against him. That's our rebellion against him. We will turn away from those things. And we will turn towards the things we know that he wants us to do. The things that are good, the things that are right, the things which we saw over the last several Lord's Days are actually what it means to love. We'll begin to love God and we'll begin to love our neighbor as we should. In other words, we will begin to follow Jesus. We will begin to become like Jesus. And we will do that because that is what we want to do because now we actually love Him. The Apostle Paul tells us that faith works by love. Genuine saving faith is basically made alive through the love the Holy Spirit creates in us so that we, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we trust Him and why we receive Him is because we, we want Him and now we turn away from our sins and we begin to follow Him because that's what we want to do. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if we have a saving faith that works by love and we love the Lord Jesus, we will obey his commandments. And the reason why we'll do that is because his commandments actually tell us what love is. It tells us how to love. If you've really trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what you will do. You will turn away from the things you know God hates. You will begin to follow Jesus you will do that not just on Sundays, but you will do that at all times, and not just in certain areas of your life and still clinging on to those things that you don't want to give up in other areas of your life. You will do that in every area of your life. Now, you won't be perfect. None of us will be perfect. We're still going to fail in many, many ways on a daily basis in our thoughts, our desires, and our words and our actions. We will fail. But when we fail, we'll repent, we'll, we'll get up, we'll keep moving forward because the Lord Jesus will make sure that we do. God's love is so great that he was willing to give his son so that if you believe in him, if you trust in him, you will not perish in his judgment with the condemnation that you justly deserve but he will forgive your sins. He will give you the righteousness of, your son, of his son. He will give you eternal life. Now again, let me just close in reminding you that what God has done, okay, he's only done once and he's only done in one way. There are not many gods, there's only one. There are not many ways of salvation, there's only one. Jesus is the only way. Jesus says in John 14 verse six, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So let me ask you this morning, have you received this gift that Jesus is, that the Father gave so many years ago? Have you trusted Jesus, not just believe the facts? Have you trusted in him? Is the evidence that you have trusted in him there? Are you turning from your your sins, from your crimes, from the things that are dishonoring to the Lord and turning into the path that he tells you is the right path that is good and loving. If that's true of you, then you are safe because of the grace and mercy of God. But if you haven't, you're not safe. And so that I would encourage you, trust him this morning. Receive the gift. It's a free gift. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to pay for it. It's something he paid at the price of his own precious son, that which was most valuable to him. He paid for it all. Jesus did it all. You just simply need to receive him, to trust him, to turn from your sins and believe on him. Receive what the Lord offers to you because it is a sincere offer and he will certainly give you what he has promised if you will simply look to his son and trust in him. Well, may the Lord grant his mercy and his grace to each one of us. And for those of us who have received him, may he also help us again to see how great his love for us actually is.